Have you ever seen a golfer putt a golf ball into the hole and then watch as the golf ball pops back out again? Well, this is why that happens. If you throw a ball into a cylinder at the right speed, in the right direction, it will come back out again. But why does that happen? Ever since my friend Hugh Hunt showed me this demonstration, I've been trying to figure out an intuitive explanation for what's going on. My first idea was to think about it from the point of view of the ball. From the ball's point of view, it feels a force flinging it towards the outside of the cylinder. That's just centrifugal force. Yes, centrifugal force is a fictitious force that you only experience in a non-inertial reference frame, but that's exactly what we're doing here. We're looking at it from the point of view of the ball, which is rotating around the cylinder. So it's being pulled towards the wall and it's being pulled down by gravity. So if we were to unwrap the cylinder, make it flat, and then tilt it, well, we should have the same thing. We've got gravity pulling the ball vertically downward, but you can split that into two components, one pulling it towards the wall and one pulling it parallel to the wall. So if I throw a ball at this, will it pop back up again? My intuition says no, and of course it doesn't. So the effect must come from the fact that it's rotating around something because the effect goes away in the flat equivalent of this. I found a couple of papers that go through the maths. One analyzes the equations of motion from a rotating reference frame, the other from an inertial reference frame. And they both conclude that yes, this is what we should expect to happen. While it's good to prove something like that, the mathematics didn't really give me an intuition for what was happening, like a hand and waving explanation, if you like. Another thing that's good about working through the maths is you get to dig out some really interesting detail. Like one thing that's really surprising is if the ball doesn't bounce out, it actually oscillates up and down. According to the mathematics, this would carry on forever if it wasn't for things like air resistance and the fact that the ball slips sometimes instead of rolling so that gravity can eventually take over. That's not the interesting part though. The interesting part is what happens when you count the oscillations. Like how many times will the ball go around the cylinder for every one vertical oscillation? And you might think, well, that depends on the mass of the ball or the radius of the ball or the radius of the cylinder. But what the maths shows us is that the ratio is always the square root of seven divided by two. If the ball was hollow, it would be the square root of five divided by two. We can verify that to some extent in this video, though it's not easy to measure this angle from the side and I need the side view to identify the vertical oscillations. So it can only be approximate, but it's roughly two turns for every up and down of the ball and the square root of seven over two is roughly two. So doing the experiment for real certainly doesn't disprove anything. If only I had two high speed cameras so I could film the top and the side at the same time. Those numbers, seven over two and five over two might ring a bell actually, if you remember my video about the turntable paradox. In that demonstration, there are seven turns of the turntable for every two orbits of the ball. I explained in that video that the numbers come from calculating the moment of inertia of a sphere, which is just how hard it is to rotate the sphere. To calculate that, you have to integrate the moment of inertia of all the little masses throughout the ball. You get a different answer for a hollow sphere, which is why you get a different number for a hollow ball, both in the turntable and in the cylinder. I haven't been able to demonstrate the behavior of a hollow ball in this cylinder for one very good reason. For this demonstration to work at all, you need lots and lots of friction because this only works if the ball rolls without slipping. Fortunately, it's really easy to get hold of non-slip balls. That's because in the distant past, non-slip balls were a really important feature of computer mice and those balls are still relatively easy to come by. As a side note, it's interesting to see how a mouse ball is constructed. If I cut one open, you can see there's a pretty hefty ball bearing in there. And that makes sense. You want your mouse ball to make good contact with the desk beneath it. So you take a big steel ball bearing and you coat it in a high friction coating. As yet, I've been unable to find an equivalently high friction surfaced hollow ball. Future Steve here, I've just had a flip in brainwave. Squash balls, they're high friction and they're hollow. Analyzing this video, the ratio seems to be about 1.75 to one. In other words, the ball goes around the cylinder 1.75 times for every one vertical oscillation of the ball. 
We expect it to be the square root of 5 divided by 2, but that's actually about 1.6, so we're a little bit off. But actually, a squash ball isn't perfectly hollow. Nothing in the real world is. Because the walls of a squash ball are quite thick, we should expect the ratio to be a little higher than the square root of 5 over 2. That's because as the wall thickness increases, you eventually end up with a solid ball. So we should expect the ratio to increase from the square root of 5 divided by 2 towards the square root of 7 divided by 2. Actually, on a similar note, the ratio we get for a mouse ball seems to be consistently a little bit higher than the square root of 7 divided by 2. And I think we can explain that as well. Because the ball has a solid steel core, the mass of the ball is somewhat concentrated towards the middle that actually decreases the moment of inertia of the ball. So we should expect the ratio to be slightly higher. But what about a nice intuitive explanation of what's going on here? Well, my first thought was maybe this is related to gyroscopes. Like you've got a ball that's spinning around this axis and it's rolling around the inside of the cylinder, but then you've also got gravity pulling down on it. So you've got the ball spinning like this, it's pressed against the wall and it's being pulled down by gravity. But you might know that when you try to twist the axis of a gyroscope, it doesn't behave the way you would expect. The angle changes instead at 90 degrees to the applied force. So as gravity pulls down on the ball, this axis of rotation of the ball will tilt like this. Suddenly now the ball is pointing in this direction. That suggests that for the demonstration to work, you need gravity pulling down on the ball parallel to the axis of the cylinder. But does this phenomenon need gravity to work? To test that, I put the whole thing on its side. And look, even without gravity pulling the ball through the cylinder, you still get the ball changing direction and popping back out again. This is the highest frame rate I can get on my studio camera. But brilliantly, I have access to this camera that can do a thousand frames per second in HD. I'm definitely not using this camera to its full potential, by the way, because this is actually a motion amplification camera. The reason I'm telling you that is because I'm on the lookout for ideas of what I can do with this thing. You might remember my video about motion amplification. Tiny imperceptible movements in a video can be amplified and analyzed and it helps predict where problems will arise in an industrial setting. RDI Technologies sent me the camera in case I wanted to make a follow-up video. If you have any ideas for things you would like to see the minute vibrations of amplified, then let me know in the comments. Or even better, join my Discord server and let me know there. There's a whole section for video ideas, link in the description for the Discord server, but also a link to RDI Technologies for all your motion amplification needs. But anyway, I think I've worked out an intuitive explanation. We assume the ball is thrown in at an angle, so the ball is spinning around this axis here when we first throw it in, and the gyroscopic effect is going to try and maintain the direction of that axis of rotation. So what happens as the ball makes its way around the inside of the cylinder? Well, let's suppose that the gyroscopic effect has maintained the direction of spin when the ball gets a quarter of a way around the cylinder. The axis of rotation is now pointing into the wall of the cylinder. So what effect does that have? As I rotate the ball in this orientation, that causes the ball to roll in a horizontal path. But by the time the ball has reached the opposite wall from where it started, if we assume that the axis of rotation hasn't changed, well, now the ball is rolling upwards a little bit. Then after three quarters of a turn, it'll be rolling horizontally. And then after a full turn, it'll be rolling downwards again. I'm not sure if that's a good explanation or not, but what I do know is that it's definitely incomplete. That's because if this was a full explanation, well, the ratio of horizontal rotations to vertical oscillations would be one to one. One turn for every one up and down. And we know it isn't that. It's the square root of seven divided by two. I don't think that means we have to completely abandon my intuitive explanation. It's just that in my explanation, the axis of rotation doesn't change during the entire journey of the ball. But in reality, that axis of rotation is pulled around, forced to change by its contact with the wall. But it's the resistance to that change or maybe the lag in that change that allows for this slow up and down oscillation. And actually that kind of fits with the different ratio that you get for a hollow ball versus a solid ball. A hollow ball has all the mass concentrated on the outside, meaning that it's harder to turn. Its moment of inertia is larger. 
Because it's harder to turn, it's harder to change its axis of rotation. So for a hollow ball, we should expect the ratio to be closer to the answer that I got with my naive assumption that the axis of rotation doesn't change at all. And in fact, it is closer. I'll leave a link to those two papers in the comments. If anyone can turn that mathematics into an intuitive description, then please let me know because so far, that's eluded me. Here's something that I haven't said before about the sponsor of this video, Incogni. First, let me explain what Incogni does in case you don't remember from the last time. Basically, there are all these companies called data brokers that collect data about you and then sell that data to other companies. Those other companies then call you up and act like they know you because they've got all this information about you. It's really creepy. Maybe they send you stuff in the mail as well. What Incogni does is contact all of these different companies in the formal way that they require to be contacted and ask that they stop selling your data and delete it. And these data brokers are legally obliged to comply with that. You could, in principle, contact these companies yourself, but there are hundreds of them. So it's almost impossible for an individual to do on their own, but Incogni have automated the process. You can then log in and see the progress. Look, these are all the companies that are now no longer allowed to sell or store my data. The thing that I haven't said before is some of these companies, like their infosec is not amazing. There've been data breaches from a number of them. And of course that data is your data. So now there are criminals that have your data instead of just these sleazy sales companies. So by asking these companies to delete your data, you are protecting yourself from those types of data breaches. I've now done it through Incogni. You know, it's one of those things I wanted to get it done, but I couldn't figure out how to achieve it on my own. And now it's done. You know, it's a really straightforward business model. And if it's something that you're interested in, the promo on this one's really good. The first 100 people to go to incogni.com forward slash science and use promo code science at checkout will get 60% off. The link is also in the description. So check out Incogni today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe. And the algorithm thinks you'll enjoy this video next.